It might surprise you to know that witches actually hate Halloween. Witches are generally very quiet, introverted creatures. So the screaming children pounding on our doors and demanding candy? That just isn't really our style. The little witch costumes are always kind of cute, though. It's nice to be a role model just for one night. Vampires, on the other hand, love Halloween. Kids aren't usually out after dark except for on this one night, and so vampires crawl out of their hovels or their crummy downtown flats to ooh and ah over the little children in their costumes. I can tell you're tense already just thinking about that. Well, don't worry. Our kind have a pact for Halloween. We don't touch children. Because of the nature of some of our population, we can't guarantee that children will always be safe. But on this one night, we make sure the kids can come out and have a good time without fear of losing a limb or worse. We're not the monsters you think we are. Well, at least not always, anyway. So, that Halloween night, I found myself sitting in my living room, studying from the anatomy of white magic, drinking some Da Hong Pao black tea sent to me from my cousin across town. I was finally totally relaxed after what had amounted to a long, hellish week, and was really enjoying myself when I heard a scraping at the window. I saw a shock of blonde hair outside the glass and had to suppress an eye roll. I absolutely wasn't in the mood to be toyed with that night, but I rose to my feet and stalked over to the window, throwing it open with a dramatic flick of my wrist. The creature outside my window clapped as though the very sight of me inspired awe. Hey, sweetheart. Invite me in. He purred, his voice deep and smooth and hypnotic. Don't call me, sweetheart, I deadpanned, crossing my arms over my chest. Jeez, fine. You can be such a hard ass, he said, irritation showing in his voice. I could tell it wrinkled him that his seductive powers had no effect on me. Come on, just let me in. I really need to talk to you. Is it about Halloween? I asked. It is about Halloween, and it's very important. I stared at him with pursed lips for a second. When people think of vampires, they generally think of tall, pale, dark hair, brooding, that kind of thing. Honestly, I blame Dracula. Bram Stoker was such a drama queen. The man before me was none of those things. He had sandy blonde hair and a deep tan, flashing blue eyes, and blindingly white teeth. He was a real beach boy aesthetic. And they call this guy a creature of the night. I scoffed. Vampires get all the good literature. I uncrossed my arms and said, Fine. Come in, Gail. He climbed in through the window and landed lightly on his feet, smiling at me. Smirking, more like it. I always knew I'd get inside your house one day. Seriously, what do you want? I'm having a perfectly lovely night, and I don't need you here to ruin it. Oh, you wound me. He clutched his heart and threw his other hand over his eyes as though about to faint. My lips twitched, but I forced back a smile. Come on, just spill it. You said it was important. He sighed. (laughs) You're no fun, you know? Then he became serious. We have a problem, down on the east side of the city. What do you mean? At least four kids have gone missing. They were trick-or-treating together. I ran into their parents, who were pretty frantic with worry. It could be nothing, but I have a feeling that somebody has taken them. Do you have anything to base this feeling on? I asked. He shrugged. No? but it's a pretty bad feeling. I'm going to go look for them. I'd appreciate if you helped me out. I gazed longingly at my tea and my book. I'd really much rather have stayed inside, but Gail was only 200 years old. 
He was still finding his feet as a vampire, and it would be just like him to run off and do something stupid and get in totally over his head. And then I'd have to deal with the fallout. At least that's what I told myself. So I'd have an excuse to say yes. I heaved a put-upon sigh. (sighs) Fine, fine. Let me get my coat. And shut the window. We're going through the door like civilized people. I turned to grab my coat, then thought better of it. I ran to the closet near the foyer and pulled out a black cloak, a bag, a pointed hat, and a broom. I heard Gil muffling laughter behind his hand. (laughs) Wow, are you for real right now? It's Halloween, I shrugged. Might as well look the part. I didn't wait to hear any of his other comments before stalking out the door in search of whoever was ruining my night. It only took me a moment to get us to the other side of town. Witches have a lot of ways of getting around. My favorite method is to manipulate reality, melt the reality we exist in, and transfer to a reality where I'm at my target destination, and then merge the two reality strands. Sci-fi fans would like you to believe that this is dangerous, but their fears are vastly overstated. There's nothing so mundane and easy to manipulate as time. Gale, however, was not nearly so used to this sort of magic. He crouched down with his hands, clutching his head when we stopped. What's wrong? Feeling a bit queasy, are we? I asked. I was glad I'd chosen a secluded area as my destination. That way nobody would bother us to ask if he was okay. How do you do that and not vomit every time? Seriously. He looked pale as he focused on taking deep breaths. I waited patiently as he calmed himself down. We were back on the move five minutes later, watching all the children running around, giggling and screaming. Look, Mom, it's a witch! A real witch! shrieked a little girl. She had a sparkly purple tutu, a pointed hat, and a very ornate wand that I surmised she'd painted herself. I see that, sweetie, said her mother. She winked at me and I laughed. Hey, you're good with kids, said Gail as we turned down a side street. There were fewer kids the further we moved, even though this part of town was pretty densely populated. You sound surprised. My voice was dry, and I was shocked to find myself a little offended. I just never knew you liked him, is all. I could get you one, if you want. He waggled his eyebrows at me, and I gave him a look of total disgust. Not like that. I just... Swipe one. You're just making it worse. I mumbled, pointedly ignoring him. He grabbed my arm and pointed at the end of the street. There was a group of parents speaking to some police officers. That must be why the trick-or-treaters are staying away from here, I thought. Let me get a little closer. I'll see if I can hear what they're saying, said Gail, slinking off down the street, hiding in the shadows of the buildings. Don't get caught, I hissed. I stood there awkwardly in the dark, wondering if I should have followed him. I was beginning to feel nervous for... Absolutely no reason at all. I wondered if it was a premonition. No, that can't be it, I thought. Gail just got his panties in a bunch over nothing. Hell, the cops will probably find those kids before we do. Maybe they just snuck off into the woods or something. Gail reappeared next to me while I was lost in thought, and I just about shrieked. Don't do that, I said. He grinned at me. I knew I could get you. I heard the parents say the kids disappeared while they were on J Street. The parents took their eyes off them, and when they turned around, the kids were gone. Jeez. How can they just let their kids out of their sights on Halloween? I mumbled in irritation. It's like they want them to get killed. We might as well head down J Street. Keep an eye out for anything suspicious. Don't worry. I'll sniff them out, Gail replied. I shuddered a little at that. It's true. Vampires have very keen senses, and his super hearing or super smelling might turn out to be useful in such a situation. 
but it was still weird and grossed me out. Unnatural. That's what it is. Yeah, yeah, I know. I'm one to talk. As we headed towards J Street, Gail asked, What will the association do if it's one of us? The association is... hard to explain. It's sort of like our version of government. It's a bit less restrictive, I guess. They don't have many rules. It's just that the rules they do have are very, very important. You really don't want to break them. Trust me. Well, there will be an investigation, I'm sure. Once the association makes a decision, I guess it would be like death. Gail paled. You mean like permanent death? Yep. I was sort of enjoying watching him squirm. So you better watch yourself. One misstep and you could have a blessed wooden stake right through your heart. He glared at me. That is not funny. He stopped short just as we stepped onto J Street. He lifted his head and took a long sniff like some kind of hunting dog. I could just picture him with the ears and the tail. It was actually a cute thought. Oh no, oh no. I shook my head to clear it of that horrifying vision just as he looked at me with excitement. I could smell it. They're here, I know it's them. What do you smell? Blood. Shit. Is it a lot of blood? I mean, the smell is pretty strong, so there must be a significant... Oh. His grin faded after he realized the implication of what he was saying. Well, maybe it isn't them after all. Can you take me to the source? He nodded and started down the street with renewed vigor. So are you going to tell me your real name? Gail asked. Nope. Gail frowned at me. Come on, we're friends. Nothing doing. Surely you don't want me to call you Ambrosia forever. I grimaced. Ambrosia is the name given to me by the Council of Witchcraft. It's symbolic, but also practical. It binds me to the other witches in our community, and if I were to ever break our code, they could use it to subdue and restrain me. Plus, no witch gives out her real name. Our real names hold unbridled power over us. And to do so could very well mean suicide. But still, Ambrosa, that's got to be one of the worst names in the history of names. Seriously. I'll think about it, I answered. Hey, if you don't want to use that name, why don't you just join a covenant instead? No. My voice came out much louder than it needed to be, but seriously, I would... Never dream of disgracing myself by joining a coven. Covens are for witches who are rejected from the council and who are stuck in the Middle Ages. You know those pictures of witches you see where there's a bunch of old, haggard women covered in boils and eating children? Yeah, those are the kind of crazies you get when you start a coven. <laughs> Hard pass. Hold on, hold on, said Gail, holding up his hand. His head tilted to the left, and he sniffed the air again. It's there. He pointed to a rather large house with the lights off. It didn't look like a super welcoming place. No Halloween decorations, no sign of life. I wonder why the kids walked up to it. Other than the fact that, you know, kids are dumb and tend to do dumb things. All right, let's go in. We made our way up the pathway, and I stooped down in front of the door. After discovering the door was locked, I slipped a bobby pin from my hair and started to jiggle it around the lock. Come on, you don't have some kind of, like, door unlocking spell? Asked Gale. He was bouncing on his feet, eager to find the source of all the blood. Yeah, I don't use magic on something that's stupid. Picking the lock is easier and honestly faster. I heard a click and tried the handle again. This time it turned. Okay, let's go. 
We entered the house, prepared to search it from bottom to top in order to find the source of the blood. But turns out we didn't have to. We found a body slumped against the wall in the foyer, blood smeared on the walls and pulled on the floor. Gail swore as I knelt down by the child and put my finger to his throat. He was definitely dead, as if the sheer amount of blood loss hadn't already given me my answer. The child couldn't have been more than eight. He'd been wearing a Superman costume that was now torn in the chest. He had multiple stab wounds in his chest cavity and a few in his legs and arms. His eyes were blue and glassy. What do we do? asked Gale, all traces of his earlier humor gone. First, let's find the others, I said. I stood up and gave the dead kid a pat on the head as though it would comfort him. Not that he really needed it anymore. A few blood drops led us further into the house, past the dining room, and into the kitchen, where we found what appeared to be the basement door ajar. As we approached the door, we could see a light and heard the faint sound of somebody crying. That must be it, I said. I turned to Gale. When we go down there, our primary goal is to get the kids out. Whatever has them, you hold it off while I grab the kids, okay? What do you think this is? He asked. He was trying not to sound worried. Well, he'd used a knife, so I would guess it's a rogue witch or wizard performing a dark magic ritual. You'll need to be careful, but we have an advantage. They aren't expecting a vampire. He nodded, and I took that as permission to begin my descent. We crept down the stairs as quickly and quietly as we could. The basement slowly came to my field of vision. There were two children, tied and gagged in the far corner of the basement, a spaceman and a pirate. At the other end of the room, there stood a man with his back to us. He was holding a young girl against the wall by her left hand. She, too, was gagged. She was dressed like a witch. I saw the man had a knife in his hand, and I realized what was happening the same second Gail did. Holy shit. He's human, isn't he? Gail didn't bother whispering or concealing his voice. Everyone in the room turned to look at it, me included, and I glared. What? He shrugged. This will be a piece of cake, honestly. I looked back at the man and the girl and saw that she was missing a finger on her hand, the man having sliced it off with his knife. My eyes went dark and I saw red. All right, Gail. Kill him. Gail's face went slack and his fangs peeked out from under his lips. He rocked back on his heels and then lunged toward the man. You'll notice that I haven't actually told you what the man looked like. The murderer. There's good reason for that. You see, he was just so... ordinary. When I first laid eyes on him, the scene seemed so absurd to me. He looked like a regular middle-aged, balding salary man. There was nothing sinister about him, nothing that would indicate that he was fucked up, that he liked murdering children. And somehow that scared me more than anything I've ever encountered in our world. And it's something I don't like to think about. So I watched Gale lunge at the man with something akin to relief. As Gail slammed the man into the wall, he dropped the child, and she sat on the ground, sobbing behind her gag. I ran to her and grabbed her, dragging her back to the corner with her friends. I set her down by her friends and started searching the floor frantically. I spotted her finger on the ground and grasped it, bringing it to her. She was pale, hyperventilating, about to enter into shock. I placed her finger back into its rightful place and reached into my bag, grabbing out a handkerchief and a small blue vial. I wrapped the handkerchief around one hand and a finger and breathed over it, mumbling a spell to myself as I did. I poured the blue solution onto her hand and let it soak into the cloth. I waited for a beat or two before removing it. Her finger was 
reattached and good as new, with nothing but a small white scar to show that it had ever been injured. She stared at it in wonder, her breathing evening out. I reached up and pulled her gag off. Hi there, my name's Ambrosia. What's your name? I asked her. She stared at me uncertainly for a moment. Her eyes shifted behind me and I could hear the slurping, sucking sounds Gail was making. No, no, no. Don't look there. Look at me. Her eyes shifted back and she took a deep breath. Samantha, she said. I smiled at her. That's a beautiful name. Are you a witch, Samantha? She nodded and then shook her head. Well, I'm not a real witch. I'm just pretending. I see. (laughs) You could have fooled me. You look just like a real witch. Samantha, I need you to do me a favor. I need you to face the wall and not turn around. I'm going to untie you and your friends, and then we're going to go and find your parents. How does that sound? She nodded and turned towards the wall. I slipped the switchblade out of my pocket and cut the ropes off the other children. All right, guys, let's get out of here, shall we? What is he doing to that man? Asked the pirate. I had a very good idea of what Gail was doing, but I decided to avoid that particular topic. You guys don't have to worry about that. That man isn't going to hurt you anymore, and my friend wouldn't dream of hurting you. We want to help you. That means you have to come upstairs with me, alright? The kids nodded, a little hesitant, but still trusting. I couldn't imagine still trusting someone after what they'd seen, but that's what's magical about kids. I led them upstairs, kept them distracted while we walked by the body of their friend. As we reached the door, I turned around and knelt down. I whispered a few words in each of their ears and watched as their eyes went blank. I ushered them out the door. Your parents are down the street waiting for you. Go on now. They walked away in something of a daze. A quick memory wipe will do that to a person. I turned back and looked at the dead child in the foyer. Know what to do with you, I murmured. I stared for a moment and then walked back down to the basement. Gail was kneeling over the body of the murderer, covered in his gore and blood. The man had been eviscerated. His entrails pulled out and spread around the room in disarray. His fingernails had been pulled out and shoved into his eyes. His teeth were scattered all over the floor. (laughs) Dude never had his wisdom teeth taken out, I guess. He was still gurgling and choking on his own blood as I walked over. I could see that Gale had left him alive, at least for the time being. Jeez, could you take any longer? I asked. The man's head jerked towards me, terror written on the lines in his face. I looked away and focused on Gail. Well, after what he did to that other kid, I wasn't going to give him a quick death. Blood dripped from Gail's lips and covered his front. His pupils were so large they overtook the color of his eyes. That happens when they feed. I'm not sure why, but I've always found it enormously attractive. But I found it even more attractive that he was showing self-control to make this son of a bitch suffer. Well, we need to pick up the other kid's body and get out of here. So if you could finish up... He nodded and grasped the man's face in both his hands. Straddling his body, he yanked hard and fast. The sound of his flesh distending and snapping was sickening. His body flailed a moment after the decapitation, but it didn't last very long. It was a relief when he stopped moving. I didn't want to think about the world housing that kind of human. Help me grab the kid, will you? We went upstairs and Gale lifted the kid into his arms. He looked at me in confusion. What do you want him for? Don't you think maybe we should just leave him here for the police to find? I shook my head. I can do you one better. I grabbed onto Gale and transported us back to my house. My plan already in place.
remind me why we're doing this again? Gail was sitting on my back porch as I placed the child in a coffin. It's a beautiful coffin. It's made of oak and has intricate carvings all over it. More importantly, it is etched with runes, thousands of them. I shut the lid and caressed it, reading through some of the runes. I smirked a little at Gail's confusion. He was about to get a first-class show, that's for sure. Are you going to, I don't know, bury him or something? I just laughed and shook my head. Have you ever heard of necromancy? I recoiled a little. I thought you were a white magic witch, not a, you know. <laughs> Jeez, necromancy isn't all about black magic. I mean, sure, you can do it that way, but it's a lot harder and it's pretty disgusting. You have to cook and eat a dog and abstain from the sight of women. It's, it's a pain, and the result is distorted. But if you do it while using white magic, well, if you're lucky, it just might work. The results aren't guaranteed, but hey, it's better than nothing. As I spoke, I took off my jacket and rolled up my sleeves. I flexed and stretched my fingers. I didn't want to pull a muscle in my hand with what I was about to do. He looked at me like I was insane. How come I've never heard of this? I shrugged. You're young. There's a lot of things you don't know. Like your phone number. He flashed a smile at me, and I shook my head in despair. There is no hope for you. Seriously. With that, I stretched my hands over the coffin. I began to mutter to myself, reciting the runes that graced the lid. My voice fell into an even cadence as I grew louder, the world fading around me in my concentration. On the fifth line, I brought my right hand to my left wrist, feeling for the pulse that beat just below my skin. On the tenth line, I plunged a fingernail through my skin and into my artery, letting my blood drench the lid of the coffin. It seeped into the ruined carvings and disappeared while my chanting continued. I could hear other voices joining me now, voices from different times and spaces and existences. I finally recited the final and twentieth line, my strength failing me. I let myself fall forward on the lid of the coffin, my blood still flowing freely from my wrist as I struggled to breathe. I was losing a lot of blood very quickly. If the ritual was going to work, and had to work now. I very vaguely became aware of being lifted off the coffin lid. I realized after a moment that Gail was cradling me, my wrist lifted to his mouth. He was licking my wound, which I realized had closed when it came in contact with his saliva. Vampire saliva has many healing properties. Not that I appreciated it at that exact moment. Don't interfere, Gail. It was hard getting enough breath to speak. I'd lost a dangerous amount of blood. You're a goddamn idiot, Ambrosia. Are you trying to kill yourself? You know you could pick a better way to do this than to bleed out in front of a vampire. I have to. The ritual. No ritual is so important that you endanger yourself like that. What the hell were you thinking? A bit of clarity was coming back into my head. I opened my mouth to retort when he and I both heard it. A tentative knock was coming from inside the coffin. H Hello? Is anybody there? Gail's jaw dropped and I struggled out of his arms, wrenching the coffin lid open. The little boy looked at me in terror. His wounds, however, were gone, and the blood had vanished from his costume. I wanted to laugh and cry at the same time. It was a victory I never expected. I struggled to help him out of his coffin until Gale took over. I didn't even mind. I was elated. It worked. I couldn't believe it worked. The coffin was a family heirloom, and while I knew of its powers, I never tried to access them before. It takes a perfect specimen. The boy was freshly dead and had a pure, innocent soul. 
with anyone else who knows if it might have worked. Furthermore, the ritual is incredibly dangerous, and many witches have died trying to complete it. That night, I could have easily been one of them. We sat the kid down, learned his name, his address. He was confused and didn't remember anything except for being out and about with his friends. He had no memories of his murder, which was good. We didn't have to wipe his memory at all. We told him he hit his head, that we'd found him on the sidewalk and brought him to a safe place to see if he was okay. Gail offered to walk him home. It was getting late now, and surely his parents were worried. And so, Gail helped me into my house and sat me down on my chair, back with my book and tea. And then he took the boy by his hand, and they walked toward the front door. I noticed that Gail had already charmed Charlie, and the two were getting along splendidly. Gail was good with kids, too. I noted that and filed it away. You know, for future reference. Hey, Ambrosia, are you, uh, busy next Wednesday? He asked me before, opening the door and disappearing into the night. I might be, I might not. What do you ask? You, me, dinner. Eight o'clock. Pick you up at 7.30? I thought about it. And then I gave him a laugh. <laughs> we'll see. But no promises. He grinned and gave me a little wave as he ushered Charlie out into the darkness. I watched them go, content in the knowledge that Gail would get him safely where he needed to go. And despite my indifferent response, I was definitely going to dinner with Gail. I groaned a little and put my face in my hand, trying to fight a smile and a blush. Whoever thought that a vampire would be my type? My junk was already at the front door when I got home. Or, well, I guess I can't call it home anymore. Goddamn landlord's been threatening me with eviction for months, but I guess I figured he wouldn't go through with it. Just my fucking luck. I still tried the key and felt all the dumber for it when I realized he'd changed the locks. I swear the guy had it out for me since day one. He looked at me the way a teacher looks at an unruly kid, always turning his nose up in contempt. And why? I have a fucking job. It's not a glamorous one, but I have one. Okay, sure, I've missed the past five months, Red, but there were circumstances or something. And yeah, I scared the neighbors, sure, but I was quiet. Well, mostly. Except when I came back from working my second job at the bar at three in the morning and needed my music to unwind. I wasn't that fucking bad. Not bad enough to have my shit ditched and the locks changed on me. <sighs> Whatever. I grabbed what I could and headed to my truck. It wouldn't be the first time I'd slum it, and it probably wouldn't be the last. I was surprised by how many trips it took to get all my things, considering I don't own much. The apartment had come fully furnished, so I had no big items to carry. Everything else was just knickknacks, CDs, and my tattered clothes. Pride and spite fought for control as I tried to decide where to park the truck for the night. Spite won out, and I found the landlord's spot in the lot and parked diagonally across it, blocking the next spot over as well for good measure. I hope it piss off 15B, or was that 158? Either way, I hoped whoever I was blocking would be damn annoyed and would blame it on the landlord. Petty? Yeah. But sometimes you need to be a little petty in life. It's good for the soul. With all my worldly shit in the bed of my truck, I sprawled down in the back of the seat and settled in for the night. <sighs> Aging is a bitch. And I realized that pretty quickly when the cramping started and my neck got sore. Being in your mid-thirties sucks. You still look young enough that people assume you can do the same shit you did in your twenties, but you feel like a fucking geriatric if you don't have a decent bed to sleep in. It fucking sucked. I was constantly waking up from the sounds of loud pops and cracks all fucking night. I thought it was weird that I heard them more than I felt them, but whatever. 
Early in the morning, I was woken up by a chorus of knocks on the window and an impatient, you can't be here. My body groaned as I sat up, every muscle tense, every bone stiff. And fuck, whatever other body parts we also have being really fucking done with this shit. And yeah, it was the landlord. I waved him off, or maybe flipped him off, and for some weird reason that seemed to piss him off more. Like, the fuck more do you want from me, dude? The guy had the nerve to open the driver's side door and chew me out. But before he could, I sat up and he turned white as a ghost, lifted his hands in surrender, and slowly backed away from the truck. (laughs) I'm not that intimidating, am I? Fucking whatever, dude. I had a job to do. The local high school wasn't going to clean itself. I knew that much from playing hooky once. I'm sure there's some kind of poetic irony or some shit from a high school dropout working a main job as a janitor at a high school. I fucking hated poetry, so who cares? I squeezed through the front of the truck and got into the driver's seat. Picked up a coffee and booze on my way to work and mixed both to help me start the day right. The day was... Uneventful. Little shits being little shits, and floors needing to be mopped. The usual janitor shit. I wasn't working at the bar that night, so when my work day was over, I had a few hours of daylight to relax and do whatever. And I was left with the same question as yesterday. Where to park the fucking truck, aka my home? I wasn't going to spend the night at the school, that was for sure. An unshaven 35-something in a trunk at night on campus? Yeah, that wouldn't end well. My official school lanyard and parking pass wouldn't get me out of that nightmare. So instead, I drove a small ways out of town and stomped on the side of the road where I didn't think cops would care. There was a nice, deep ditch I could go do my business in without being seen by passing cars. I had takeout for supper, a couple of burgers and fries sitting at my feet so they wouldn't spill. Once I parked, though, I realized they forgot one of my burgers. Like, seriously, could shit get any worse? Not wanting to drive all the way back, I put my headphones on and ate bitterly as I watched the sun set through the trees. I almost fell asleep in the driver's seat while music was blasting through my ears. Almost. And I think that's what saved me. I don't know what would have happened to me if I hadn't snapped awake and moved to the back seat for the night. I... I don't even want to talk about it. So I moved. I closed my eyes. I don't know how long later... I hear this weird-ass sound. The sound of something slapping... Slap, 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 followed by a meek and gravelly, help. I opened my eyes to a bright kind of darkness, the dark of a starlit sky and that always blinking blue light on the dashboard. Confused and disoriented, I mumbled, What? Reality sank in, and I remembered I was in my truck, not back at my ex-home where the pipes were always leaking and the mold in the bathroom looked like Abraham Lincoln. A voice replied, Help. Help. I rubbed my tired eyes. A million thoughts ran through my head and settled on some sort of car crash nearby and someone needing to be pulled out of the rubble. But as I sat upright and swept the outside by gaze, I didn't see any cars or smoke or anything else. Help me, groaned the voice, a voice that clearly came from the front of the truck, now that I was conscious enough to pinpoint it. I reached for my bat and peeked through the gap of the center console, only to see movement as something long and stick-like reached out from under the driver's side seat and swatted at it. Slap. Help. 
help me. I whispered a fair share of expletives. This time, the old noggin box didn't come up with any theories. What the fuck? Help. 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 The stick-like thing slapped the seat again. I made like a cat trying to avoid the water and squeezed myself through the front passenger seat so I could get in the front and get the fuck out. Whatever was in the truck didn't follow and I was thankful for that. I sat there breathing heavily, eyes wide and wondering if I'd... I don't know, had my drink spiked? There was something in my truck, something I could still see moving, something that evoked a memory of a sleepless childhood night when storms sent branches swatting at my bedroom window. I felt that same potent fear, the fear that they'd reach in and pull me out by my ankles. The difference is, I'm a grown-ass man, and I have a bat, and that was my fucking truck. I swallowed the fear, and though it came back like acid reflux, I tried to not let it stop me. I circled around the truck, bat in one hand and my other hand stretching toward the handle. My truck. My goddamn truck. My fucking home. I opened the door and reared the bat back. And stopped. The creature was... Under the driver's seat, wedged pathetically in the tight space with nothing but its stick-like arm able to reach out and slap the seat. It didn't even have enough range to hit the steering wheel. The thing was... Well, it looked fucked up, okay? It was a fucking monster, what more can I say? A monster with stick for arms and a bunch of little beady eyes, and it was stuck under the seat. The bottom... No, the top, the top of its head split open vertically in a way that reminded me of a pincer. It spoke. Help me. It looked so fucking pathetic, I almost felt bad for it. What? It asked again. Help me. I let out a nervous laugh. I couldn't wrap my head around this. First of all, the nerve of this thing, creeping into my truck and begging for help. I slowly lowered the bat. I'm stuck, it said. Yeah, I can see that, I replied. It chittered and said, I'm not as flexible as I used to be. You and me both, buddy, I thought. There was more room under your bed, it said. I blinked. Excuse me? It replied. That's where I live. Under your bed. I scratched my head. You're telling me you're the monster that lives under my bed? I am, it said. But since we got evicted, I had to squeeze under here. And that's how you got stuck. And that's how I got stuck. It looked at me with pleading eyes as its thin fingers scratched at the seat. I hoped it wouldn't tear the leather interior. That would really ruin my fucking week. I considered my options. If I help you, what's in it for me? I asked. Because I sure as shit wasn't helping a fucking monster out of my car without some sort of reward. I'll leave the altruism to altruistic people. It seemed to stop and think for a moment before it made me an offer. If you help me, I won't eat you. I snorted. Well, that's a shit deal. If I don't help you, you can't eat me. How about if I help you, you eat my landlord? I laughed. It laughed. We both laughed. 
and then it blinked with its multiple eyes, not at the same time, mind you. It was kind of like a wave at a hockey game, one at a time in a circular motion. Okay, but seriously? It asked. I shrugged. I mean, I was kidding, but I trailed off. Look, the landlord might be a bastard, but I'm not going to put a hit out on him. I mean, if I just so happen to come across a monster and we happen to drive by his place, I can't control what the monster under my bed, under my truck seat, does. That's on him. The monster said, Well, I am hungry. That burger really wet my appetite. <sighs> you motherfucker, that was mine, I shouted. But like, can you blame the thing? I would have stolen a burger too if I was cooped up under someone's truck seat and shoved it in my face like that. Okay, okay, fucking fine, I mumbled. I'll drive to his place, we'll get you out, and then you do your thing and you leave my truck for good. Understood? I gave him a stern look. He nodded, or tried to. His second and third arm were pinning his head. I motioned for him to lower his other arm. If you grab me while I'm driving, I'm warning you. I will leave the truck in the sun tomorrow so you bake alive. And no touching my junk. I motioned to the radio and crumpled up pieces of paper. Or my junk. And motioned to my groin. Clear? Crystal. Chatty McChatterbox tried to make conversation the whole drive back to town. I was not enthusiastic about it. Do you think I live alone because I can't get a boyfriend? No. It's because I like the fucking silence. I like my music and I like not having to talk to people. So I did what any person would do. I turned the music up to drown out the monster under my seat. We arrived at the complex about an hour and a piss break later. I parked off the beaten path. A shit parking spot. Basically, and got out of my truck. My dumbass monster was twitching, trying to get free, and looking at me in desperation. I rubbed my temples and sighed loudly. Alright, give me your arm, I mumbled. The stick-like appendage stretched towards me. I grabbed it and started to pull. This motherfucker was in there tight. No wonder he couldn't get out. I pulled and twisted and put all my strength into it, and he would not budge. Thankfully, I had lotion in the trunk bed with the rest of my bedroom stuff for uh, my chronically chapped hands. I lathered up my monster, and he finally slid out with a nice pop. He was a clumped mass on the floor for a moment before he started to unfurl, much to my horror. I don't know how many fucking arms he had because I lost count at six, but there were a lot. They were all flared out in different directions. When he stood upright, he easily towered over me. And I'm six five, with his stretched limbs bringing him almost twice my height. His hands were branch like, but his elbows had serrated edges, and all I could think was what kind of mess he'd made on the other side of my seat with those. If he'd wanted to, if he hadn't been the monster of his world, he could have cut me down with one swipe of a single one of his many arms. Instead, he turned to the apartment complex. Which unit? I'd all but forgotten our deal, awestruck by the large creature and the impossibility of him fitting under that seat. Uh... I pointed dumbly at the apartment. That one. My monster nodded and lumbered toward the landlord's unit at a slow pace, his bones popping and cracking as he went. And I mean, yeah. I think we're both too old to be sleeping in a truck. Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed tonight's stories. Um, 
If you did, let me know which one was your favorite in the comment section below. I think the second one was actually my favorite. Even though it was a little goofy, um, I thought it was a fun little story. And it reminded me of that, that old childhood fear of something living under your bed. Which, me as a kid, I never had the fear that something was living under my bed because I shoved everything under my bed. Toys, clothes, you name it, it was probably under there. I actually um, dropped Silly Putty behind my bed when I was a kid in the middle of summer. And no, it was the middle of winter. And my parents turned the heat on at night and it melted to the carpet. And uh, they weren't very happy about that. But that brings me to tonight's question. Um, when you were growing up, did you believe that there was a monster under your bed? Was there a monster in your closet? Where was your monster? Was it outside, like the tree limbs, like they mentioned in this story? For me, uh, the monster was in my closet. Which, if you've heard my closet ghost story, you would know why. <laughs> I kind of believe that. But like even before that happened, which that happened when I was 13 or 14, um, I, I don't know. I, just, I was always off put, put off, rather, um, by closets, just in general. There's something about them that made me very uncomfortable. Not really sure why. Um, but that was at my parents' house. At my aunt's house, when I would stay there, I wasn't allowed to just shove things under the bed. She was much more... <laughs> she was kind of a hard-ass when it came to cleaning up and doing it correctly. We always kept a really nice house. But even then, when I knew that there was room for like a monster under the bed, you know, I still was afraid of the closet because she had these really old, like, um, sliding door closets. They didn't even have, <laughs> they didn't even have door handles. They just had little like inserts. I don't know. I think her house was built in like the fifties or sixties. So, um, but yeah, and, and the closet has just always been very scary to me. Which is kind of hilarious to say as a queer person, but... Um, anyway, so yeah, the question for you all tonight is... Did you believe that there was a monster under your bed or in your closet? And if you did, what did that monster look like in your brain? Your imagination goes crazy as a kid, so I would love to hear where your monster was... Excuse me, and what your monster looked like. I think that'd be really cool. Anyway... Take care, everyone. Hope you have a wonderful evening, morning, or night, wherever you are. Or evening, morning, afternoon, wherever you are. Take care of each other, and sleep tight.